Okay, if you want to take your seats, we'll go ahead and get going with the second part of our panel. And uh, first of all, I, do, I want to apologize to John Novak. I got my times mixed up a little bit, so I heard him along. I apologize for doing that. Hopefully, we, he got his information out, and if we have anything left, we can finish it during our uh, Q&A afterwards. What we want to do now is walk through the clean power plan and the effects on base and electric and kind of what base and electric is doing to meet the clean power plan objectives and kind of how we're going to handle everything that's coming at us with the clean power plan. First thing I want to do is have everybody draw your attention to Basin's generation portfolio. You've seen this, it's on our website. Two things I want to draw your attention to are number one, the blue pie chart that shows 54% of our, of our generation portfolio is coal-based. Now again, this is the, the, the generation portfolio that's available to us, not what's being used. The second thing to look at is the amount of wind. You've got 810.7 megawatts of wind generation by the end of 2015, and you're gonna have about 44 megawatts of recovered. So those two items are gonna be our renewable, port, or renewable portion of our generation. So keep those two things in mind. 56% coal and about 850 megawatts of wind. This is how much those generation units run. So I want to make sure that no one's misled. When you look at base electric, we are a coal-based generating facility and a coal-based power producer. 80% of the power that your members receive is going to be from coal. So the clean power plan is going to have a huge effect on us from what we've got available and what we run. The other thing to keep in mind, and everyone is more than aware of this, is the generation growth that we've got out there of about 2,800, almost 3,000 megawatts in the next 20 years. An interesting fact that's out there is when you talk to EPA, you talk to EIA, their projections are that the, gen the electric, electricity use in 2017 and the electric use in 2027 is projected to be almost the same. They anticipate with energy efficiency that's going to be out there that there's going to be little or no growth in, gener in, in electricity use. Not the case in base electric situation, not the case in our membership situation. So we have got uh, something that is not the norm compared to what's out there. Again, you look at what's happening in the, in the western North Dakota and eastern Montana, 65% of our load growth is in the Bakken. So the, the clean power plan, thanks to John, he gave us a good overview of where we're at with the uh, clean power plan's development. But just to go back, so if you've got a question of how we got to this point, it all started with the Supreme Court ruling in 2005 that said CO2 is an air pollutant and it will be under the clean power plan. And that's what opened the whole door to this regulation of CO2 from power plants. So you got the 111D is in dog for existing, 111B is in boy for new. I thought that's one thing to bring up as well. You need to take a complete separation for what we're gonna do with our existing generation and existing load. That's 111D and you got 111B is in boy for the new generation. There's two different requirements for each one and we're gonna have to meet each one of those with the generation portfolio that we put together. So how do we get to this point? People ask, well, EPA has been putting regulations on power plants for years. Why is this one so different? Why are they looking to totally remanufacture the grid and the generation that we do? And the main word you need to look at is system. EPA is looking at the best system of emission reduction, and system used to be the power plant. So they would look at the power plant, look at the emissions generated, and then work with technology and have that apply to the power plant. What they have done with this rule is they now say that system is anything that affects generation or usage. So that's why they've taken this and moved it, uh, what we call outside the fence. It's not just what's inside the plant, that's how they're looking at adding the electric gener or the wind generation and looking at energy efficiency and all those other things. Their definition of system changed with this rule. So the rule itself, and this map has been out there, John had a portion of it out there, but you look at the proposal, and everyone has seen that, look at your state, Minnesota, or North Dakota 11%, Montana 21%, Wyoming at 
and then the large shift that we had happen with the final rule, looking at uh, North Dakota 45 percent, Montana 47, Wyoming 44. Two things I want you to look at. Number one, just look at the congregation of states. This is a Midwest situation that we're looking at. We are the ones that got hit the hardest. We're the ones with the most generation that's out there. So this is going to be a fairly regional problem for us. Not so much on the coast, not so much in the south. It is in, in, in an area that, from a political standpoint, has some political clout, but not a lot. So we've got that to keep in mind. The other portion of that is the percentage reductions on that are from 2012 forward. So if you wanted to get technical about it, from 20, 2005 to 2012, North Dakota reduced their emissions by 14%. So if you take 40% and add it onto the 45, you're looking at almost a 59% reduction from 2005 levels, where the president was saying he wanted 30% reduction to 2005. So this region, are these states that Basin serves are asked to do much, much more than what was in the original plan. What we don't know, like I said, prepare to be disappointed if you thought you could walk out here, out of here this afternoon or tomorrow with all the answers to 111D. But we don't know what the exact rate impacts are. We're just starting to get a handle on that. How states implement their plans, it's going to be a huge situation that we're going to have to understand what other states are doing to understand how any state that we operate in is going to handle it because of what EPA has done with the rule. Will multi-state trading programs be developed? or will national, will a national program of trading credits be developed? We don't know. How will generation in other states be treated? You know, before there was the, when the proposed rule came out, there was a big discussion of, well, what if uh, we've got generation in South Dakota, wind generation in South Dakota, can we use it in North Dakota? Can we use it in Wyoming? And so that was a big question. And EPA, with their final rule, didn't really answer that. It's now, a little more convoluted than it was because we need to look at what do the contracts say, where do the credits go, where does the power go. So that situation is still out there. Um, the last item, how will this impact infrastructure and pricing for natural gas electricity? If we're supposed to put a lot of gas generation out there, then you've got to have new gas processing plants, you've got to have new pipeline systems, you've got to develop transmission lines to get to that point. So there's a huge number of unknowns that are out there. So we've taken a three-prong approach at Basin Electric for dealing with the plan. Number one is beat the rule. Support any efforts to delay or overturn the rule that we can. And they be those that are run by the states, be those that are run by other organizations, be those that are run by industry. We want to support what we see as an overreach by EPA on that. That being said, that's not the only thing we can hang our hat on. The timelines that are out there are tight. If you're looking at a final plan coming out in 2018 and implementation started 2022, we're only looking at a four-year time frame. And as everyone in this room probably knows, to design, build, a design engineer and construct any type of project, it takes a minimum of five years. If you don't trip NEPA, if you trip NEPA, you're gonna probably look at seven years to do that. So beat the rule, we're gonna support legal efforts against it, meet the rule, determine what it takes to, to come into compliance in the states we operate in. And the third thing is change the rule. And this is something that hasn't been talked about a lot, and it's something that's in the future for us. But if the legal strategies fail and we have to look at compliance, are there some things that we can do that will try to soften the impact of that rule? And as John said, you don't, we don't put a lot of hope in what can be done in Washington, D.C., but as you look at what happened when the rule came out, at this point, there are 26 states that have challenged the rule. There are 24 states together that are challenging the rule. You had Oklahoma and North Dakota that are opposing rules separately. So you've got a majority of the states in this country opposed to this rule. We think that gives us a chance where you may find enough support in Congress for a very specific items that could make some impact on it. That is the hope that we're looking at. The state implementation plan is key. I would say if from, from uh, what we need the members to do is to be very aware of what's going on in the state as far as looking at um, input from the public. 
There's states that are in, in uh, order for states to get a two-year exemption, they've got to have public input, and so we're starting to see things start to happen. State of North Dakota has, I believe, four meetings scheduled the next two weeks for public input. In talking with uh, Todd Parfit, the head of DEQ in Wyoming, they're not going to do any meetings until next spring, but there will be public input meetings, and that will be the time to get either the technical stuff out there or the financial impacts of this plan in front of uh, your state regulators. The whole idea behind the EPA rule is that EPA was to set the guidelines and the state determine the implementation. So we want to keep focusing on that so the state plan is critical to the whole process. I'll get a little bit into the weeds in the next few slides, so bear with me. As we talk about the emission-based plans, a state can either do one of two things. They can do a rate-based plan which says we're going to emit so many pounds per megawatt hour. Now, EPA has said, here's the numbers you've got to meet, and it's 1,305, I believe, for a, yeah, for a coal-based plant and about 970 for a, for a natural gas plant. Now, both of those numbers are not going to be able to met, be met without some kind of offset on them. When we look at a, go at a coal-based plant right now, we generate about 2,200 pounds of CO2 per megawatt hour. With the newest technology, that could be brought down to 18. It can't get to 13 on its own. The natural gas combined cycle are about 1,000 pounds per megawatt hour. Again, you can't get down to that 900 level without so much other types of offsets. So states can choose a rate-based plan, or they can choose a mass-based plan. Mass-based is just, here's a cap. You cannot emit any more than what you've got, and again, on your existing rules. You look at new generation, that's a whole other category. But on your existing, you're going to have that cap. The third item they've got is a state measures plan. Maybe there's states that want to do their own specific type of CO2 reduction that wasn't laid out with EPA's plan. EPA says, well, okay, that's fine, you can do that, but you better have an EPA-approved backstop in case what you want to do doesn't work. So those are the items that we're looking at. We're kicking around, because with the state plan, we've got no credit for the DGC sequestration that's going on. So we're thinking, well, maybe there is a state measures plan could get us some credit for that, something that we worked on. The last kicker that EPA threw in there was that if you're going to trade credits, you can only do it with another mass-based state, or if you're a rate-based state, go with, a, with another rate-based state. So where we get into a, a problem trying to figure out where we're going to be at is if you're in a state with growth, such as North Dakota, you're going to say, well, a rate-based plan works because it would allow you to grow as long as you keep in those numbers. But the, what we've been hearing from other, other states in the nation is that there's only going to be three or four right now that are looking hard at being rate-based, and you've got the other 30, 40 leaning towards being a mass base. Well, if we need to trade credits then, we're going to have to be mass based so that we get availability to credits. So again, a lot of things that, are, that, that the people at Basin are working through to try and determine what's best. We don't know at this point whether a rate-based or mass-based item would be better for us. With a rate-based option, we've got, we've got concerns with both, the race and, rate and the mass-based. When you look at a race-based program, if you're going to keep your goal generation running and just add enough wind to keep doing that, what we've looked at with North Dakota, Wyoming, and Montana, it's, uh, it's going to be a 0.8 to 0.9, really if you want to just round it up, say almost a one-to-one -one megawatt hour of electricity from wind for every megawatt hour of coal you put out. So if you, if you take that down, that's going to be a lot of wind to order to keep the coal plants running at their current levels. Then EPA threw another kicker in there that said any wind that you added between 2005 and 2012 doesn't count. We're only going to count from 2012 on. As you saw on that first slide, we've got seven to 800 megawatts of wind, well, I say about 700 megawatts of wind that was pre-2012 that's going to be unavailable to use. So that's the hard part. So we're looking at new wind that goes in. North Dakota, South Dakota, Wyoming, great wind states. No one doubts that at all but you're looking at about a 40% wind factor, or capacity factor on that. Go to my third bullet down there. We've got transmission, uh, or, or looking at how you determine that. So you figure if you've got 1,000 megawatts of coal, you'd have to add 2,500 megawatts of wind to get you that almost that one-to-one -one megawatt hour coming off wind and coming off coal. 
and you know as well as, as anybody in the room, coal plants can't chase that much wind. There just isn't the variability to make that happen. The problems that we see with a mass base, we're still looking at a 40% reduction if we go with a mass base plan. So you've got to throttle down some way to get your, your, your cap to that point. There's what they call the anti-leakage position, and I will tell you, I've talked to at least 10 people and had them try to explain anti-leakage to me, and I'm still very rough on it. But what it just says, if you've got an existing plant, what they're trying to avoid is someone just saying, okay, we're just gonna build all new gas plant, and that's going to the new gas rule, and that's gonna get our existing down. And they're saying, no, you gotta find a way to, if you're gonna put new gas on, there's gotta be an also a certain reduction on the coal side. So that's in there. So in other words, it kind of puts a, a cap on your existing source. Um, again, the other problem we have with each state, when you look at a mass plan, each state is allowed to determine how they handle the, the, their, their allocations. So you may have a state that's not friendly to coal, just says, you know what, we've got credits available, but we're just not going to sell them to anyone for a coal-based generating plant. You've, they've got the ability to determine what happens to those credits. So if we're looking at, well, we're going to just buy a bunch of credits to do this, we've got to know what other states are doing to determine if we can get to there. The state measures plan, um, again, we have to have a unit by unit backstop that's EPA approved, even if the state says this will work in our state, EPA says, well, that's fine, but you need to have something else to approve it. Um, we're not clear how trading works. The, the, big, the big thing is looking at being able to trade credits to get enough credits to get your coal plants to keep running or to keep them running at a higher level. Um, they do allow energy use efficiency in other part of the plan. Again, this is something we may look at to try and get some credit for what we're doing at Dakota Gas. The last part of this is EPA has that final hammer. Everyone has kind of said, well, what if we just don't do anything? What if we just say, you know what? The hell with you. We're going to run our own plan, do our own thing, and we're going to take care of it our own way. EPA says if you don't follow the rules, they will come in and they will determine how your plant will operate with a federal implementation plan or a FIP. So that is always hanging out there on top of us. If we don't follow the rules, don't come up with a plan that we think is close to what they need to have. We're looking at the FIP plan. We think EPA is leaning towards a mass-based plan, although at a meeting last week um, with uh, Janet McCabe, I was chastised for assuming that EPA was leaning one to the other. They're saying they're completely fair and trying to make them both the rate and mass level, and we are not in favor of one versus the other, so I've been told. We're looking at a 90-day comments on the federal plan that we'll be looking at making comments for. Another thing we're looking at is remaining useful life. We've got investments in those plants that we want to get used up. I'll give you a quick example. Leland Old Station, we put $400 million in there for mercury controls, another EPA control. We expect that plant to run X amount of years because of that investment. So that is the remaining useful life that we want to make sure we can, can use. Our response, from a government relations standpoint, from an environmental standpoint, and legal standpoint, we've been making trips to the states to talk with them. As you can see in there, especially in Montana, South Dakota, Iowa, and Wyoming, on a regular basis, six to eight weeks, we try to get there, talk to the Attorney General's office, people from the Governor's office, their DEQ, or their Public Service Commission. Let them know what we know and get their input on what we're doing on. So we're being in clear, very close contact with the plans to try and be as influential as we can on their state implementation plan. Just a quick run through of where we're at. When you look at North Dakota, strong support from the Governor's office to the PSC to the Attorney General's office. Same thing in Wyoming, a lot of support on that. Keep in mind, it's the Department of Natural Resources that will do the plan. South Dakota, strong support in opposition to the rule. It's gonna be their Department of Environment and Natural Resources that develop the state plan for South Dakota. Montana, we've got good support against the plan. The Department of Environmental Quality will be doing their state plan. In Iowa, Iowa's the only place where we've got a little different situation. You've got a Democratic Attorney General who has come out in support of the Clean Power Plan. You've got the governor is more on the neutral, maybe a little bit opposition to the plan, but we don't know whether he's going to be willing to step out and oppose it in spite of what his Attorney General says. So in Iowa, there's a little different situation than what we see in other states. 
When we go to visit these states, here's the five things that we're asking the state to consider. Number one, do what you can to get the two-year extension. We just think that that's going to be better for the utilities to get more time to plan. It's going to give the legal system more time to work. So we're saying just if you can get the extension, do that. We have had good support in every state, and every state intends to do what they can to do the two-year extension. We say delay a decision on rate versus mass, mainly because we don't know what we need, and we're going to have to find what other states are doing before we determine which way we want to support. Consider the availability and price uncertainty of, of ERCs and allowances. EPA and, I, and a lot of utilities that we talk to are just saying, we're just going to buy credits. You know, when you look at the whole plan, there's three ways to comply. You either add a lot of renewables, wind or solar, you shut down your coal, or you buy credits. That's the three ways you get to compliance. And a lot of places we talk to say, well, we're going to do a little bit of everything, but we're going to end up buying credits. And we're saying, do you know that the credits are going to be there? Well, we assume they will. Do you think they'll be affordable? We assume they will. We're very cautious on that and saying if, if the EPA is going to put in a huge trading program, the state should put in some backstops. If the credits aren't there, then what happens? If the price is too high, then what happens? Give us some off-ramp, get some, some confidence that the utility maker, or the consumers aren't going to get hit really hard with the, with the price of this program. And the last thing, allow for the useful life. Again, as I explained before. The last thing that we, we really try to hit them with is look at the clean power plan and understand the state's authority. EPA has kind of given short shift, in our opinion, to the authority of the states. And we're telling them, do what you think is right. The states, when you look at the plan, it says you have to consider the cost of technology. You have to consider the reliability. You have to consider um, everything, uh, you know, other things within that plan. So just say, you as a state determine what you think is the, is the authority that you have and develop a plan based on that authority. Don't just de defer to what EPA is telling you. To beat the rule, the legal issues we're looking at, um, you know, the, the, the numbers have changed. Where we went from 11 to 45 percent, all the states in our area got a huge change. We didn't have a chance to comment on that. We think that was wrong. We think that setting, just setting 2012 as a date where you couldn't charge, you couldn't count your win, we think that is wrong. Um, we had a situation in South Dakota where South Dakota got a credit for their hydropower, but none of the other states with hydropower did. We think that's something that needs to be looked at. We'll get a, I'll try to run through this quickly. Common issues that we see, there's, a, there's an argument with the, some of the, the things in the rule where they're covered under different portions. Emissions are covered under 112, so they shouldn't be under 111. That'll be debated in the, in, in the uh, legal arena. Uh, the, common, the outside the fence saying, EPA, you're supposed to handle what happens inside the power plant, not determine how we generate with wind or what runs and what doesn't run. Uh, from a cooperative standpoint, the, uh, power, the Power Plant and Industrial Fuel Use, Act, Fuel Use Act of 1978, when we were building our plants, Antelope Valley Station, Laramie River Station, it was mandated from the federal government you could not build gas. You had to build coal because gas was, 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 was too precious of a commodity at that time to use. So you're saying, you know what, you told us we had to do coal, now you're saying we can't do coal, give us some accommodations for that. They have remaining useful life with, so they want to look at that. Issues that are, are unique to the, to the states that produce the power, if we still run it, want, to, want to run the, the plants, everyone understands that the, all the power that they produce doesn't stay in the state it's produced in. It goes to other states. So we're going to need credits from those other states to keep producing the power that goes to their state. Um, and that's either if you do it a rate-based plan or a fossil-based plan, you've got to do both. We're, bothered, we've already, we're using coal that's high in CO2, so it's just the way the, the plants work. And so we have to find ways to accommodate that if they want to keep the power going to not only the states where it's generated, to the states that consume it. So how can we meet the rule? And these are general things that we've looked at. If we were going to do just wind, if you're going to add enough wind to keep the plants going, we would have to add 4,500 megawatts of wind to keep the plants going. I'll remind you back to that first slide we saw where we've got about 800 megawatts of wind that we started in 2001. So it took us 15 years to get that 800 megawatts. To add another 4,500 megawatts in that time frame is going to be very tough to do. 
If you're looking at buying credits, we would have to buy credits equal to an 1125 megawatt power plant. So those are kind of the bookings that we're getting. As we move forward, we'll get more into those numbers. I'll have a little bit more for information for you at the very end of the presentation that we'll walk through as well. And then what if you do a little bit of both? If we had 2,000, 2,500 megawatts of wind and throttle back our coal, where do we end up? We end up bringing our coals le coal plants less than 50%. And as you all know, that's tough for a coal plant to do. We normally want to run that full out is where we get the best efficiency and the least emissions. Change the rule. Again, these situations, if the legal remedies don't follow through, how can we lessen the impact? We're looking at rifle shot type ideas here. And this is where we're going to pull in the legislative arena. And this is where, we're, if we get to this point, we're going to need your help with your congressional delegations in D.C. So number one, we want to look at the federal situation. Um, as John said, right now, we don't have enough support to override a presidential veto. So based on the final rule, if we get some rifle shots, we may be able to do it. Getting the renewables to qualify from 2005 to 2012, the congressional delegations are in support of that the National Fuel Use Act accommodation, and accounting for growth as we look at, can they look at something like that? Is there a way to get some early adopter credits for things like we did, such as DDC? Strengthening that reliability safety valve. Some ways to do that to give us more confidence that we're not going to run into a brick wall or hit extremely high cost to our members. And the hydropower generation that we looked at. We'd like to see the rules stayed until legal issues are out there. Those are, that's in progress. Remove the interim goals. That interim goal in 2022 is a huge hurdle to hit. And we're saying, why don't you remove that and just go to 2030? And we say that EPA never looked at the financial or the economic impact to the state when you look at a 41% reduction. So we're asking about that. And looking at new source review not being targeted. With that, I'd like to move on, and we've asked, we've had a, been very lucky to have people from other GNTs in our region to, to talk about what they've got going on. With the Clean Power Plan rule, it's so individualized as far as how it impacts you. You know, this is a one-size-fit rule that they're trying to put out there, but yet it affects every utility difference. I just gave you too much information on how it affects base and electric right now. But right now, we've got to, we're very lucky to have people come from other GNTs to tell us what they're going on. So we've got representatives from Minn Kota Power out of Grand Forks, representatives from Dareland Power out of La Crosse, Wisconsin, and Tri-State GNT out of uh, Denver, Colorado. We'd like those folks to come up now, and we'll start out those presentations. With us was Stacy Dahl with Minn Kota Power, Kendrick Scable from Dareland, and Paul Griffin from Tri-State. Stacy Dahl is going to be the first one out of the, out of the box as she comes up. Um, Stacy is the manager of external affairs with Minn Kota, and again, Minn Kota is located in Grand Forks. Her role at Minn Kota is focused primarily on environmental regulations and government affairs. Prior to joining Minn Kota in 2012, she was a state legislator in the North Dakota House of Representatives, a Grand Forks assistant city prosecutor, and an attorney in private practice. She resides in Grand Forks with her husband and two children, so please help me welcome Stacy Dahl. Well, thank you very much, and it's great to be here. Um, we enjoy a very good and close relationship with Basin Electric, and so thank you again for the opportunity to be with you this morning. We are uh, a GNT located. If you could pull my slides up there. Sure. Uh, we are located just to the east of Basin Electric. We serve about one third of North Dakota and the northwest corner of Minnesota. We were formed in 1940. We have 11 member owner cooperatives, three in North Dakota, eight in Minnesota. And within our service territory, we have 12 municipal electrics, which form the Northern Municipal Power Agency. So all totaled, we serve roughly uh, 35,000 square miles with about 143,000 customers. So relatively speaking, and especially in comparison with Basin, we're, um, we're somewhat smaller uh, in that regard. Just to give you an idea of what our resource mix looks like, all of our generating resources are located 
in the state of North Dakota. So we've got hydro from the Garrison Dam, we've got uh, wind energy in Langdon and uh, Ashtabula, and all total that is about 350 megawatts. So on a per member basis, uh, we lead the, the nation in uh, renewable energy resources. We also have lignite facilities um, the Young Station units one and two are operated by Mankota and uh, Square Butte, and those municipals I mentioned also have take about 30% of the output uh, from the Coyote Station. So where does our energy come from? When you look on a capacity basis, again we have roughly 29% of our resources coming from wind, another 9% hydro. So we're almost uh, in that 40% range uh, when you talk about non-carbon based resources coming on that, uh, on that capacity. But when you look at that blue column, 59% of our resources come from coal. And that's all lignite coal, which uh, I think has been mentioned is a somewhat low rank, it is a low rank coal uh, that has a higher carbon uh, emission rate. And when you look at what we actually produce, because as you know, the wind only blows about 40% of the time, uh, wind actually generates about 15% uh, from our generating resources. So under the Clean Power Plan, what does compliance look like for Minn Kota Power? Uh, it's, it's quite clear, and Dale went through uh, rate versus mass and what's uh, included in each of those approaches as outlined by the EPA, but it's very clear that under a rate-based approach, Minn Kota would have to invest more. We would have to do more to become compliant with the standards as outlined by uh, EPA. We are uncertain of availability with those carbon credits. As Dale mentioned, I know the EPA has expressed confidence that those credits will be there will be affordable. I have yet to meet anybody in the industry who is similarly confident. So we're uncertain of what kind of um, market and at what price those credits will, uh, will be. We know that under a rate-based approach, we're gonna have significant reduction in our coal resources. We know that we won't have credit for that existing wind. So if you remember back to that slide I showed you that 30% roughly 30% uh, wind capacity. That large investment made by our membership, because it fell before that 2000, uh, 2012 uh, deadline, uh, we won't get credit for, the, for that resource. And so we'll have to uh, invest further significantly in renewables, and we would likely have to add natural gas with adding all of the wind that we would have to. This is just an illustration. This does not um, definitively uh, conclude where what we would do to comply with a rate-based compliance uh, plan, but I think it's a, it's a good illustration as to the large measures we would have to take to comply. So assuming that we can retain our coal units, that they're allowed to operate, what would we have to do to reach that 45% reduction? We know that we would, have to, we would have to throttle those coal units back. Now to what degree depends on how many credits are available. So there are so many variables that we have yet to define specifically what that will look like. But we know that we'd have to add uh, two to 300 megawatts of natural gas generation and around 600 megawatts of wind generation. Again, we already have 350 megawatts of wind, which is our, currently our most expensive resource. So when you look at adding potentially 600 megawatts of wind and natural gas for a utility our size, that becomes quite significant. On a mass-based approach, again, we're uncertain of the availability of CO2 credits. Even under a mass-based approach, we will have to reduce output from those coal facilities. There is some credit uh, for the, the wind energy that we put in, so we'll receive some credit on that end. There's likely a minimal investment in new renewables 
and we wouldn't necessarily have to make an immediate investment in natural gas. As an illustration of a mass-based compliance approach, uh, one of the approaches we would have to take again, we'd have to reduce output from our coal units, depends on the coal, I'm sorry, the carbon credits available and anywhere from zero to 100 megawatts of natural gas generation would need to be added and anywhere from one to 200 megawatts of wind generation. So when you lay that on top of what would be required under a rate-based approach, again, under a mass-based approach, we would have to um, make fewer investments. Dale touched on the North Dakota process, which we are um, very, very, involved with because all of our generating resources are in North Dakota. But as I mentioned, half of our load is in Minnesota, so we're staying very involved on that side. And I've been asked to comment on um, the political reaction in Minnesota and where the SIP development lies in Minnesota as well. You're probably aware Minnesota has a very strong environmental community who are very active, very aggressive, as it relates to state policy. Governor Dayton is, um, has a very close relationship with those groups. He recently said, Minnesota should eliminate coal use, full stop. And I think he has been very clear as to where he is on uh, coal energy and that it should not be a part of Minnesota's resource mix. And within his lifetime, he said he would like to see coal use um, end. So if, if nothing else, he's been very clear. He also made a comment that as it relates to North Dakota's climate change policy, that we're all a bunch of Neanderthals west of the Red River. So again, strong personality, strong position on this. And you can really see those positions uh, filter down through the various approaches of the state agencies and um, very much an environmental bend um, with, with regard to uh, state ag agencies. Now, Senator Klobuchar is generally supportive of the Clean Power Plan. We visited with her staff last week. I think there might be some limited opportunities where we can work together, um, but certainly um, she's made her support known of the Clean Power Plan. Senator Franken has been helpful in the past on environmental regulations. Again, he's supportive of carbon regulation, um, but again, there may be some limited opportunities. When you talk about congressional reaction, it's really mixed, and I wanna give you two examples that even within the DFL in Minnesota, there are uh, differing positions on the Clean Power Plan. So Representative Keith Ellison from the Minneapolis-St. Paul area held an event with fresh energy that included um, music and spoken word artists uh, celebrating the Clean Power Plan. And I don't know what a spoken word artist is. I think it involves poetry. Um, so most of us in the co-op world would not put poetry and the Clean Power Plan together in the same context. But that's one example of the reaction uh, from Congressman Ellison in uh, Minnesota, and then you've got Congressman Peterson from Northwest Minnesota who said he regularly stands up in his caucus and really challenges his members to think about the way they talk about uh, climate change, uh, especially with regard to um, staying relevant in middle America. So those are the two extremes even within the DFL in Minnesota. It, it really depends on where that p particular congressional member uh, represents. There's good support from state rural DFLers and Republicans as it relates to cooperatives and utilities uh, in general, but in particular cooperatives because there is a recognition that we are unique. As far as SIP development, Minnesota feels it can achieve their goal uh, using existing programs and coal plant closures that have already been announced. Just a few closing observations. We agree that this 
uh, clean power Clean Power Plan uh, has changed dramatically from the draft proposal to the final rule. And simply looking at the math, we cannot continue to operate the resources we have in North Dakota without, uh, without adjustments. And certainly those adjustments will come at a great cost. Costs will go up. And the timeline, as mentioned, that first compliance date in 2022 applies a lot of pressure for us to make decisions quickly, uh, prematurely, and most likely irrevocably. So um, thank you again for the opportunity to share with you this morning the impact to our uh, company. And then I'd like to hand it back over to one of our region's premier spoken word artists, Dale Nieswag. <laughs> Thank you, Stacy, very much. Next, we'll have Kendrick Scable. And Kendrick is a senior government, rep government relations representative for Dairyland Power Cooperative, which is located in La Crosse, Wisconsin. His role is to monitor and influence legislative and regulatory policy at both the state and national levels in Minnesota, Iowa, and Illinois. Kendrick also serves as a community li liaison, interacting with community leaders and local residents while discussing energy issues with elected officials, he finds it helpful to discuss the cooperative difference, and that is how cooperatives are owned and governed by their members. Prior to joining the government relations team at Dairyland, Kendrick served eight years in the Minnesota State Senate, representing a rel relatively rural area in southeastern Minnesota. A mechanical engineering engineer by training, Kendrick worked in the power generation industry and taught high school mathematics and physics early in his career. Kendrick and his wife Karen raised their two children on a farm near Preston, Minnesota that has been in his family for 100 years. So please help me welcome Kendrick Scavel. Good morning. I have to say I am impressed at the attendance at this event, which I understand is actually a pre-event before the annual meeting. And I think the attendance speaks to two things. One, the concern that we all have about the impact of the Clean Power Plan. And two, the commitment of cooperative folks like yourself to not only understand it, but rise to the challenge. Um, I'd like to extend my greetings, first of all, from Daryland to our friends at Basin. We get a chance to work together on a regular basis. Dale and I tend to work a lot together in Iowa. I work with Steve Tomac in Minnesota, and uh, I think there's a new addition to the team that I'm getting acquainted with as well. So it's good to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to share just a few thoughts about how the Clean Power Plan is being received in Wisconsin, kind of the political environment, and frankly, how Daryland is responding to this point. Uh, to get started, I thought it would be helpful. To give you just a little overview of who Daryland is. We were created in 1941, headquartered in La Crosse, Wisconsin. We have slightly less than 600 employees, 1,300 megawatts of generation, 3,200 miles of transmission line, and we serve in total about 575,000 people. So that gives you a little flavor for the scale of Daryland and our location. Um, certainly not quite to the scale that Basin is. We're a smaller operation. Our service territory, like Basin, we do serve a number of states. We are, our largest um, representation is Wisconsin, the western half of Wisconsin, where we serve 18 member co-ops. We also serve three cooperatives in southeastern Minnesota, three more in northeastern Iowa, and one co-op in northwestern Illinois for a total of 25 co-ops Within that service territory, we also serve 17 municipal consumers or customers. Now, a little disclaimer, you might see that that says the USS Daryland. That is not our ship. 
But I put that up there for a reason. When, when I started, I came out of the legislature, I started working in government relations, and one of the engineers pulled me aside and he said, Kenrick, this is what you need to know about the utility business. We're kind of like a large ocean liner. We move straight and smooth. We don't change directions easily. And co-ops even more so. We're like a larger ship because we're even more resistant to rapid changes in direction. And I was thinking of that the other day, and so I thought, I wonder what kind of changes we've gone through in the roughly 15 years I've been at Darylin. And so I pulled up our generation portfolio in 2000. At that time, we were probably 95% coal. We had seven coal-fired power plants, one natural gas plant that was actually quite new at that point, one hydroelectric facility that had been in our portfolio since the early 50s, and we had all of, get this, seven-tenths of a megawatt of wind generation in our portfolio. As you can see, heavily invested in coal, as much of the Midwest is. So, moving forward to today, I thought, well, let's see how resistant to change we've been. And our portfolio now looks like this. One, biomass plant, burning wood waste. Two, hydroelectric facilities. Three, coal-fired generators, down from seven. Three, landfill units. Three, utility-scale solar facilities. Nine, anaerobic digesters. 10 community solar programs with more under development, 12 wind projects, we're soliciting 25 megawatts of solar, and we have about 625 distributed generation projects within our service territory. And it just struck me how dramatically the portfolio had changed. Now, we're still heavily invested in coal, but our portfolio has become much more diverse using a number of technologies that we simply were not in tune with 15 years ago. So as you can see by that compare and contrast, Daryl and like most of the GNTs, has been moving towards a generation portfolio that emits less CO2. The clean power plan is going to accelerate that movement. We are going to have to turn, in my opinion, the ship even more sharply in the next 15 years than we did in the last. Each utility is going to be impacted differently. It's going to depend upon what is your individual state target or targets. What is the state implementation plan going to look like when it's crafted? What is your g &T's generation portfolio look like today, including what's the age of those coal plants? Do they have five years of remaining useful life or 25? Something in between. And here's the big unknown. The final plan is going to depend upon what other utilities do as well. Dale talked about will there be utilities that overcomply, shut down coal plants, and have excess credits to sell or not? These are all variables that it's going to make it pretty difficult to sort out, at least initially, just what the impact over the next 15 years is going to be. This is a map that was up once before today. I thought it would be good to not only reinforce the impact on your states, but you can see how Darylin's impacted. Wisconsin, roughly a 41% reduction in CO2 per the goal. That's what we have to achieve by 2030. Minnesota, 40%, Iowa, 42%, Illinois, 44%. You can see we're all clustered in the low 40% range. And of course, the basin states, even a little bit higher. These are not going to be easy targets to meet. Now, I thought it might be helpful just to give a little bit of lay of the land politically in Wisconsin because ultimately this is intertwined in politics. 
Republicans control both the House and the Senate. And you're probably aware Governor Scott Walker, a Republican from Wisconsin, uh, he was, uh, he's been a controversial figure in his tenure. Matter of fact, uh, he's probably the only governor, governor in, the, in the country that's won three elections in four years because he had to survive a recall election as a result of a major battle. He went, uh, he went to battle with the unions over collective bargaining rights his first term. He was a candidate for president. He spent some time in Iowa shaking hands, getting to know the people. And in that short candidacy, he stated publicly that if elected president, he would dramatically rein in EPA. He has since dropped out of the presidential race. Although publicly he still continues to oppose the rule, it's our perception that not being a presidential candidate will now give him a little more flexibility in terms of how he postures and what the state does. Wisconsin and 25 other states have filed a lawsuit to challenge the Clean Power Plan. The lawsuit is being challenged, frankly, as an unlawful plan that would radically restructure the grid. The Public Service Commission has, has uh, stated publicly that they estimate the cost of the plan to Wisconsin would be somewhere between three and 13 billion dollars between now and 2030. And frankly, we've gotten somewhat mixed signals in Wisconsin. We had Governor Scott Walker as the presidential candidate saying Wisconsin wouldn't file a SIP. But just last week, we had the Public Service Commission chair stating at a, a public meeting that she is meeting weekly with the DNR to work on the Clean Power Plan. So we're not sure exactly where the politics are going to take us in Wisconsin. A little bit of a kind of a spotlight on how Daryland is responding. Daryland did sign on to the NRECA litigation with a number of other GNTs that's challenging the clean power plan. Our staff, like staff in every utility across the country, is analyzing just what the rules are, and we've begun working on a compliance strategy. All of the Wisconsin utilities have been meeting together. The belief being that if we have a unified voice that we can bring to the Wisconsin DNR, we can better influence what that state implementation plan is going to look like. And as such, we're working collaboratively with the DNR. Uh, Daryland, as well as all the other utilities in Wisconsin, prefers that the state files a state implementation plan rather than being subjected to the federal plan as crafted by the EPA. So we're hoping that the governor will be responsive to the desires of the industry most impacted by this new rule. Unlike some utilities that serve multiple states, all of our 111D or all of our coal-fired power plants are located in one state. They're all located in Wisconsin. You can see we've got Genoa at 300 megawatts, Magic 387, Weston 4. We uh, have an ownership share in that. All three are in Wisconsin. And as such, the Wisconsin SIP is a big deal for us. It's our highest priority. But with that said, we're not ignoring what's going on in the other states in which we serve. Uh, we've been meeting with particularly the other G&Ts in Minnesota, in Iowa, and we're trying to form common positions, common talking points. So we've been coordinating positions with Basin, with Minn Kota, with um, East River, Corn Belt, NIPCO, GRE. It's important that, as an industry, we work together as much as we can on finding solutions to the challenge that's been put before us. 
among the states where we serve but we do not have coal-fired plants, our, our top priority is the ability to trade credits across those state boundaries. And I think Basin would probably share that as one of their priorities. The ability to move credits across boundaries. And our other, our other concern, in, particularly in Minnesota, is because of the environmental bent of Governor Dayton, he was unable to get a 40% renewable portfolio standard through the legislature. We're concerned he may try and roll that into the state implementation plan, kind of along the models of EPA. If you can't get it legislatively, see if you can do it by rule. That would create a pancaking effect, because even though none of the GNTs that serve Minnesota have coal plants in state, we would now not only have to respond to the SIPs where we have the coal plants, we would also have additional renewables we'd have to build from Minnesota. So we want to try and guard against those kinds of situations. So what might it take to meet the goals? I just, uh, this is sort of a back of the envelope. What would it take to, to achieve a 41% reduction in CO2 by 2030? And I've, I started just from the assumption we want to keep our coal plants. We want to keep run those to the end of life if possible. That means we're going to have to either reduce how much they run or we're going to have to buy carbon credits to offset their emissions or a combination of the two. We'd we'll probably have to add a significant amount of natural gas generation and even more wind generation. And when you put that in perspective of, what do we have, roughly 800 megawatts of coal fire generation, you can see the cost impact this rule is going to have on all the utilities having to build new, new uh, facilities. I am right on time. So just concluding thoughts. The grid really has only been around about 75 years and it's been described as the single most complex machine ever built by mankind. I'm a little biased with an engineering background, but the grid was designed and built by engineers. It's a marvel. Its operation has been enhanced by economists to make it more efficient. EPA's Clean Power Plan is an environmental policy. It was crafted by the Environmental Protection Agency. The economists were not in the room. The utilities engineers were not in the room. It is poised to redefine federal energy policy. It's going to dramatically alter the grid. So Dale, I really liked your three-pronged approach. Help me out. Kill it. <laughs> Beat the rule, meet the rule, change the rule. Change the rule. I think that's a, a great way to sum up how we have to respond to it. It's been a pleasure. Appreciate the chance to uh, speak with you this morning and look forward to uh, continued conversation. Thank you, Henry. Our last presenter is Paul Griffin, and Paul Griffin is with Tri-State g and Paul's been working in the electric co-op family for the past 10 years, first as a lobbyist handling federal power and natural resource issues with NRECA, and for the past five years being a senior government relations advisor at Tri-State, handling federal, national, and Nebraska, Wyoming legislative issues. Paul got his initial exposure to electric co-ops as a senior legislative assistant for Congressman Greg Walden of Oregon from 1999 to 2004. His wife, Allison, and two sons currently reside in Erie, Colorado. Please welcome Paul. Well, thank you very much, Dale, for that, uh, for that introduction. And I'm, I'm happy to be here to kind of share some thoughts on where uh, Tri-State exactly is with the uh, Clean Power Plan. Um, gonna keep this obviously very high level because quite frankly, uh, we, we just, I mean, the rule is, as has been stated here before, is 3,000 pages with another 1,000 pages of, 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 of data drops and whatever, and it's just the most complicated rule 
that we've ever, ever faced on top of all the other regulations that have been promulgated by the EPA, you know, uh, the match rule, coal ash, everything else. So it's, it's just, it's, it's given a lot of people at Tri-State a lot of work to do, including myself, which I guess is good for uh, job security. Um, so, <coughs> uh, so I work for a G&T that operates in four states, so we're aptly called Tri-State. Um, I'm just seeing how many people are still awake out there after, you know, it's been two hours of this stuff. Um, I actually, uh, to give you a little context about Tri-State, um, we uh, were initially formed in 1952. We were uh, paper and g and until about uh, uh, 1992. Um, we merged with a, 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 a g and called Colorado U back in 92 to give us our generating facilities, which was uh, Craig and Nucleus Station on the uh, west slope of Colorado. And then um, around the 2000 period, uh, we merged with another g and called the Plains. Uh, uh, down in New Mexico to give us another 12 members. So altogether, we have 44 um, electric co-ops and PPDs. I don't want to forget my PPD friends. And um, we serve uh, over 200,000 square miles. We have uh, about, we approximate about 1.5 million customers. And, um, and recently, we could, you could almost call us Cinco State because we do have a, uh, we, back in 2006, uh, we um, uh, partnered with Tucson Electric Power and we built a 416 megawatt facility in Springerville, Arizona. And um, remember that fact because kind of, it kind of uh, leads into some of the issues we might have down the road with uh, 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 adhering to, to whatever um, state implementation, federal implementation plans come down the pike. Uh, just a couple facts that you'll see there on the slide. We are um, the first, uh, the largest GNT when it comes to transmission. Uh, given the, you know, if you look at where we are, we're kind of on the cusp of, we're in the Intermountain West, but we still kind of serve the plains on the east side of our system. Uh, so we're the first, we have about 5,200 um, miles of high voltage transmission. Uh, we, ha with that kind of Intermountain West territory, it um, gives us a lot of challenging issues when it comes to uh, building transmission. Uh, we have a lot of our transmissions, particularly on the western slope of Colorado, up into Wyoming, and down even into New Mexico, where we have a lot of tribal issues. Uh, we uh, have a lot of issues permitting transmission. We even have issues uh, permitting transmission in an existing right-of-way. Um, right now, uh, we have a uh, project down in the southwest part of the state. It's called the Montrose Nuclear Cajon Project, which we're simply trying to rebuild a line that's been in existence for almost 50 years. Well, actually about 55 years. It was originally built in 1958. And um, we're updating it from 115 kV to 230 kV. And man, I gotta tell you, uh, some of the crazy stuff that comes out from the Fish and Wildlife Service, the BLM, about how they want us to move forward to build in an existing right-of-way anywhere from, you know, why don't you just underground the whole line? Well, that'll add $60 million to our members' rate base, thank you. Or, you know, just just move it. Or can't you, you know, why do, why do you, you know, can it be wireless? I mean, it's just crazy. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, that, I think that's kind of, I'm glad uh, Dale invited us over here because we have, um, I think with that federal footprint, it gives us kind of an interesting dynamic. But you know, talking about our energy portfolio, um, we're still given um, what Dale said earlier about when did we build or when did our predecessor entity, Colorado Ute, build? We we um, we built during the Fuel Use Act period, which incidentally, Congress thought it was such a great law that they repealed it in 1987, um, and. We built from like 75 to 85, Craig Station was built. It's about a 1300 megawatt station. We think it's one of the, one of the better controlled facilities in the country. And then we have uh, Escalante Station down in um, New Mexico, which we acquired during the, when the, the merger, and that's uh, another 240 megawatts. And then our Springerville Station out in eastern Arizona, I'll move to the next slide, um, is um, another 416 megawatts on top of the 24 
24% stake that we have in, uh, in Basin. Inside joke between me and Dale, that's what we're laughing. Um, but then you'll see with this next kind of uh, generation map, we have added an incredible amount of renewable resource over the last 10, even five years. Uh, our, we started off with uh, wind on the uh, eastern plains of Colorado, and then um, we uh, have a, an interesting project down in, uh, in northern New Mexico, New Mexico called the Cimarron Station, which is a 30 megawatt station built by Southern Company on Ted Turner's ranch, and we have a purchase power agreement to have uh, to, to to use all that electricity for our member systems, and it helps us meet the uh, New Mexico Renewable Portfolio Standard. On top of that, when we, when you include our um, allocation of WAPA power, we we believe we are almost up to 24% renewable. But that brings into question, you know, depending upon who you talk to, we, um, we obviously believe federal hydro is renewable, but some of our more enlightened, or I should not enlighten folks in the environmental community don't believe it's renewable. But, you know, we, all, given all that we have, we're about 24% renewable. Um, as far as the, you know, we've been talking about how, how each of our systems is hit by the, the final um, uh, uh, clean power plan uh, rule. Uh, you see in this slide, overall, we have a 32% nationwide reduction target. And then those next arrows there show you what we were, what we were facing in the five states in which we have interest. Um, and you can see the rate base versus the mass base. I'm not going to get into which plan we might follow because it's extremely too pre premature. But you can see we're, you know, given what state we're in, we're kind of mirroring the national goal, but it's gonna be incredibly difficult given that each state has to come up with its own state implementation plan um, to, to figure out where we might go forward. So I think that slide really illustrates the um, difficult task ahead for, um, for Tri-State. Um, you know, potential risks, as I noted, um, as everyone's noted here, uh, that we have some of the newer coal plants um, across the country. And we're looking at, um, particularly in Arizona, under the original uh, clean power plan rule, you know, Arizona was given a target that would have, would have meant that every coal fire generation unit in the state would have been shut down. And that would have been for Tri-State, if that plan had moved forward, that would have meant that we would have had a billion dollar stranded asset out there. Um, and that's, that's on top of, you know, maybe some of the controls, um, some of the other stranded a investment we might have moving forward with respect to what we've done with Craig Station on Regional Hayes. We've, we did $300 million uh, of, of recent investment on Craig Station with Regional Hayes. And, just all the other controls we've put on some of these, some of our, our, our coal ge fire generation to bring them uh, up to sm snuff with other, with respect to other environmental regulations. And then on top of that, you know, I brought up the difficult, difficulty of, uh, of uh, building uh, transmission out in the West. Um, we have taken, um, we've really tried to tap the renewable potential, particularly in Colorado and New Mexico, by uh, moving forward with uh, transmission projects. About five years ago, we tried, we teamed with XL Energy to move, to build a transmission line into the San, Lu San Luis Valley, which had been identified by the uh, Department of the Interior as some of the premier um, solar um, potential in the country. Well, wouldn't you know about I don't know, 10 miles of that proposed transmission line went over a billionaire hedge fund manager's ranch. And he threw everything but the kit kitchen sink at us litigation-wise to prevent us from building that line. And eventually we abandoned that route. Now the kicker with that, that problem, and this is just an antidote as far as where, how hard it is to build transmission to, to meet some of these renewable goals, is that we tried to uh, we, we abandoned this east-west route, and then we tried to come up through New Mexico. Well, in northern New Mexico, the folks up there really wanted a, down there really wanted a national monument. 
So just as we announced the new route, a national monument was declared and we couldn't come up north into the San Luis Valley to um, uh, meet the, to, to, um, to provide, to get, tap into that solar potential. So that's just one anecdote on how hard it's gonna be to meet some of these renewable mandates. And quite frankly, and I, um, one of those, um, uh, it, it's where kind of the uh, engineers have kind of tried to tackle the issue with the EPA. And the EPA was just like, well, just build it faster. Just, you know, just do it. And it's like, well, you know, you got all these other smattering of uh, environmental regs uh, to deal with. Um, this is just gives you an idea of where we are with the um, uh, uh, with respect to each state in which we have an interest or operate. Um, in Colorado, uh, I'll just give an example of an interesting situation emerging. Our newly elected um, Attorney General is uh, Cynthia Kaufman, and uh, she recently joined the uh, uh, other Attorney Generals, the majority of them in the state now, and joining them. Uh, in um, opposing or you know, joining in the lawsuit with the EPA against the EPA on 111D. Well, the governor, uh, Cynthia Kaufman's Republican, uh, the governor, John Hickenlooper, is a Democrat, and he's asked the uh, Supreme Court of Colorado whether, for an opinion on whether or not she can move forward without his assent because he's supporting the Clean Power Plan. Down in New Mexico, we have the opposite problem. The uh, uh, governor, the attorney general, Balderas, has joined the state's, uh, state's attorney generals that are supporting the clean power plan in a letter. And the governor, uh, Governor Martinez, is a Republican. Um, she's not as kind of forthright as Governor Hickenlooper of Colorado and saying, hey, you know, I'm the governor. You know, you need to consult with me. So kind of an interesting political dynamic there. Um, and then in, uh, you know, we've, uh, in Nebraska, you've got um, the, the governor and the AG on the same page, and, um, and Wy Wyoming's always the best state. Well, to my, every, everyone out, Wyoming's always there where we need to be on the environmental regs, so no problem there. Um, as far as what Tri-State's done on, um, you know, we have a two-pronged approach here. We're engaging with the, uh, the states on the development of their state implementation plans. But we're also being very aggressive when it comes to legal challenges, including um, we just recently filed on our own uh, a challenge in the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, which is kind of the jumping ground to the Supreme Court uh, for appellate action. Uh, we filed our own petition review of the EPA rule saying that, that EPA doesn't have the legal authority. So we're being very aggressive. Our board has directed us to um, seek regulation mitigation and can't get more um, aggressive than this. Legislative action um, with the um, uh, election of Senator, uh, with last, last cycle was kind of a surprise in Colorado. I've lived there for five years and I'm always surprised. I think the, the pendulum is sw swinging one way of politics and then it swings right back. Um, last cycle we had uh, one of the kind of the uh, the lions of the kind of the Kennedys of the West was defeated in um, uh, an election. Senator Mark Udall was beat by um, uh, Congressman Cory Gardner, which had the kind of down ballot result of flipping the uh, Colorado State Senate from a 20 or it was 1817 Democratic control to uh, 1817 Republican control. And given such an event, uh, the, the state Senate, the state House stayed uh, under Democratic control, but we in the state senate we moved legislation stating that you know if if the state's going to move forward on a on a state implementation plan for the clean power plan that we need to uh that this that that at least the puc or the legislature needs to have a little bit of a say in what moves forward now that passed on part of the line vote and uh died in the senate but at least it was a messaging piece saying hey we need to need to move forward uh, this, you know, they, this kind of shows you how, in, this slide shows you how engaged uh, we are with respect to um, the whole organization at Tri-State tackling the Clean Power Plan. We have a whole team in place, and it's, you know, numer number one issue for us in, in moving forward. So that's just kind of the makeup. I mean, it's everyone from the CEO down to me and across a broad spectrum of the uh, um, 
uh, of the company, of the cooperative. Uh, just some guiding principles on uh, where we stand. We want to make sure any state implementation plan is, uh, includes affordable, uh, reliable and for affordable electricity supplies. And just kind of recognize the uh, uh, kind of limitations of the new generation that the EPA wants us to bring online. And this is not a blank slide. I got creative with PowerPoint. It comes back to bite me. Um, but here we are. Here are the uh, kind of three elements we're looking at at Tri-State. We want to make sure that moving forward, any plans are, are inclusive of everyone, you know, at rural and urban alike. Um, we want to make sure that that policyholders and everyone understands that it's going to take a lot of investment in renewable energy. It's going to take investment in renewable energy, but you cannot just dismiss fossil fuel out of hand. And then in, in addition to working um, in working with, to develop state plans, we are going to take a two-prong approach and also continue to fight the EPA uh, plan in the, in the courts, in the federal court system. So thank you very much. I hope I'm on time. And those are the next steps, but there you go. All done. <laughs> okay. thank, thank you, you. Paul. I know we're running tight on time, but I'd like to ask the other two presenters to come up and ask or is there any questions from the audience that you'd like to ask any of the panel members at this point? We can go ahead and do that. Uh, we've got some mics on each side. If there's any, if there are any questions that we can see out there, find somebody with some mics and we can ask those. Just to kick it off a little bit, I'd like to ask the three G&T representatives, what are you telling your members or your employees at this time about the Clean Power Plan? Because a lot of this is going to be in communication, getting that information out. And I don't know if you want to start off. Stacy, you got the mic. You want to kick it on? It should be on. It'll be is on. Is it on? Yep. Okay. Um, one of the things Minn Kota, I think, in my opinion, has done a really nice job is um, when the Clean Power Plan was rolled out in its final version on August 3rd. Uh, our CEO, Mac McLennan, um, made a special effort to convene all employee meetings so that the rule could be explained and that the risk could be appropriately identified without, you know, trying to scare anybody, but so that that dialogue was open and honest and transparent. And I, I think that was well received by our Okay. Paul, what have you been telling your folks? You know, yep. uh, we've been, we've, we've received direction from our senior management team to be kind of just very careful because it is such a complicated rule. There's a lot to, um, there's a lot to figure out. It's 3,000 pages and, you know, we don't know. <laughs> Which way we're going to go moving forward, um, other than you know what I just highlighted in our in, in the presentation. So it's um, basically a long road ahead, and you know just um, you know just continue to get educated as we figure out what's in the role. Okay, Henrik. Probably the, the the most challenging part is trying to communicate about what's the implication, what's the cost. We we get a lot of requests of. Tell us what this means to us in terms of rate increase, et cetera. And we don't know those numbers yet. Um, we're probably having the same communications internally as, as most people where we try to educate. We have articles, et cetera, um, about how the plan is structured. But probably our number one message at this point is this is a marathon. And so let's not overreact. Let's try and dig through it, take it one step at a time. And um, you know, we'll, uh, we'll. Frankly, we don't have the answers yet. Yeah, very much so. And if there's if there's a question out, go ahead and raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you when you, when we when we can. With your see your hand up, John. If we could ask a question of you, with NRECA, are you seeing any regional pockets that are coming together as far as? Those that oppose the rule are the up the the upper or west northwest. Are they in favor? Are we seeing pockets or regions of support, regions of opposition 
that in nationally that we're not seeing here? You know, I think as you you could tell if you look at if you look at the map, you'll see areas of the country and almost blue states and red states. A lot of the blue states came out better in the final rule than the traditional red states. So California, New York, New England, Oregon, Washington came out much better in the final rule. Now in terms of electric cooperatives and, and working together, uh, I think we're all working in lockstep. We have been working very closely with our members. Uh, most recently in September, we had a CEO fly-in in, in Chicago to make sure that the steps we were taking, NRECA was, is taking, are supported by our members. And, and so our members are in lockstep in challenging this rule and then in working together to figure out a way collectively that uh, if we have to, how we can comply uh, with this rule at the lowest possible cost to allow us to continue to provide affordable, reliable electricity. You know, the investor-owned community is split. There are a number of investor-owned utilities who see this as a windfall. And so they are supportive of the rule. And yet there are others, on the other hand, who are like co-ops heavily invested in coal and are, who are litigating. But, you know, we are together on this one. And lastly, Chris, we, we keep hearing from EPA that we've got a, there is going to be a future for coal, there is going to be coal in our future, but from our, some of us, we have a hard time seeing that. From your point, from the research side, are there still dollars available from the federal government? Do you see any indication that the federal government sees coal in its future? Okay, thank you. Uh, I have to be perfectly honest, okay? Uh, I've worked uh, in research for 30 years, and uh, the... Uh, Research dollars across the entire United States are severely constrained. Uh, there just aren't the types of RFPs, FOAs, that give opportunity, especially for smaller colleges and universities like, like the EERC and UND, NDSU, et cetera. Um, that being said, there's also been a shift in where those dollars are going. So when there are RFPs to do funded research through the federal government, uh, they, in the fossil space, they have been restricted just to carbon capture, CO2 capture, and CO2 storage or sequestration. Anything else that would benefit um, new materials for supercritical boilers, uh, new initiatives for oil and gas uh, have not been funded. Just those two little areas. Anything can pollution control, SOX, NOx, particulate. We still don't have all of that figured out yet. There is no research. So th there isn't a lot of help there. Where we're finding most of our resources is with industry and with uh, states uh, like North Dakota has really excellent state resources for uh, continuing to push the envelope for fossil fuel research. Go ahead. And, and, and Chris made some good points earlier in talking about global use of fossil fuels. Okay, we may curtail or some may want us to curtail our use of, of coal and other fossil fuels. But if we're going to meet the kind of goals that people are talking about, climate goals, you know, other countries are going to make use of low-cost fossil energy. And if we can't come up with a solution to allow them to do that in a cost-effective way, the world can't afford to achieve the kind of climate goals that people are talking about. And, and our research and development in these technologies is just woefully insufficient to get us on that kind of pathway. Thank you. Any, are there any questions out there that I'm not seeing anywhere else? Okay. With that, I'd like to have everyone please thank all the panelists for coming in and sharing the information that they did. I've got one final comment with the EPA Clean Power Plan, this rule has been kind of a shifting sand under a lot of people's feet. Um, this Thursday, Basin Electric will be filing a motion for a stay with the D.C. Circuit Court. The schedule was, was hugely accelerated by EPA just last week. Normally, Basin Electric would have 60 days to file a petition for review and would normally have had another 30 days for a motion of a stay with the D.C. Courts. Last week, Thursday, we were told that EPA went to the D.C. court 
and asked for and received permission to require all motions for stay to be filed by November 5th, which is Thursday. So the 60 day and 30 days are out the window. Our legal department is working hard. They will meet this new timeline. But do you understand, to be granted a stay in the motion, which means they couldn't implement the rules until the legal challenges were completed, you got to meet some very high bars. Number one, you have to show that there is irreparable, irreparable harm for the duration of the legal challenge and that there is a likelihood of success with the legal challenge. Now, in that motion for stay, Basin has to discuss the harm that it will receive because of this rule and if it occurs because it's implemented as it is. Those harms are going to include the cost of adding a large amount of new generation and eliminating large portions of our existing generation. And then those, those generations, as we talked about before, have remaining useful life on them. Now, a lot of these dollars would have been spent anyway, you know, adding generation and maybe finally reducing some of our existing generation, but this is all going to be on a very accelerated schedule now with the clean power rule. There's going to be some numbers in that document, and those numbers will be in the billions of dollars that it's going to cost base electric if this rule goes through. So the document, like I said, will be filed. The final document is still being prepared. It'll be filed on Thursday tomorrow. There may be some reports that come out, but we want you to be aware of that that document is out there. Some numbers will be in there, so you'll probably be hearing about that. With that, that's the end of our town hall meeting. We want to thank you all for coming and attending with us and taking part in this. Again, thank our panel and enjoy the rest of the meeting.